Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our panel discussion. I'm Allison Hamblin, President and CEO of the Center for Healthcare Strategies, and I'm so honored to welcome you to join us for today's panel, Undoing Cool, Addressing Persistent Disparities in Tobacco Use and Cessation. As many of you know, smoking is the leading cause of preventable disease in the United States, with a disproportionate impact on the Black community. This includes high levels of disease burden and mortality related to tobacco use. We're so pleased to bring together today's panel that will address this critical issue from many angles, including the implications of the recently announced and long awaited proposed FDA ban on menthol tobacco. Before we dive into today's agenda and introduce our panel, I wanted to provide some brief background on the Center for Healthcare Strategies or CHCS for those of you who may be less familiar with our work. As a national nonprofit organization, CHCS's mission is to strengthen the US healthcare system to ensure better and more equitable outcomes, particularly for people served by Medicaid. To do this, we partner with state and federal agencies, health plans, providers, community-based organizations, and communities and consumers to address obstacles that stand in the way of health and well-being, particularly for people facing the greatest disparities. With that focus, we partner to identify and support more effective models of care delivery, more effective and efficient policy and program design, and ultimately our goal is more equitable care. As particularly relevant to today's conversation, for more than five years, CHCS has had the privilege of collaborating with the CDC to bring state Medicaid and public health partners together across the country to increase access to evidence-based tobacco cessation treatments and to promote increased use of covered services by tobacco users. Reducing tobacco use and increasing uptake of tobacco cessation services is critical to help people lead healthier lives today and to reduce the long-term impact of chronic diseases related to tobacco use, including heart disease, stroke, cancer, and COPD. Our conversation today will take us a step back into the history of tobacco use in the Black community, including the preference for menthol cigarettes, driven largely by exploitative marketing practices. After this critical history lesson, our panel will focus on strategies to improve health equity through targeted tobacco cessation efforts, with a particular emphasis on opportunities to leverage Medicaid for this purpose. Note that throughout today's presentation, we encourage you all to submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and although we have a structured discussion um, set up for our panel, we will do our best to um, include your questions uh, in our mix. So thank you for submitting those as they come to your minds. We are delighted today to be examining this timely critical topic with such a distinguished group of experts. Our panelists represent deep expertise and experience in the history of tobacco use, as well as efforts at the federal, state, and local levels to support cessation. First, I'm so honored to welcome Keith Waylu, Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University and a longtime and highly dedicated board member uh, for this, uh, the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Through his work, Keith uses a historical lens to examine how issues of race, ethnicity, and identity impact health and health policy. His writings explore key social policy topics, including racial disparities in cancer prevention and treatment, the culture and politics of pain related to sickle cell disease and opioids, and today's focus, racially exploitative cigarette marketing, which has led to gaping disparities in tobacco use over time. We've been so lucky at CHCS to have Keith's keen guidance on our board for the past 10 years and are thrilled to share some of his work with you all today. And the rest of our panel, um, we are delighted to have Sally Herndon with us, who has been a leader in North Carolina public health efforts related to tobacco prevention and control for more than 30 years. And she currently heads the Tobacco Prevention and Control Branch for North Carolina's Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome, Sally. Next, we have Del Monte Jefferson, who is the executive director of the Center for Black Health and Equity, which is a national nonprofit that fosters innovations in public health programs to benefit Black communities nationwide. He has worked for more than 20 years at the national, state, and local levels to shape policies to support smoke-free establishments and restrict the sale of menthol and other flavored tobacco products. Welcome, Del Monte. Next, we have Carlos Negus, who oversees activities at the CDC to implement evidence-based best practices for tobacco cessation across the country. 
Previously, she worked in Indiana on tobacco control and prevention and has a wealth of experience in what it takes at the ground level to support tobacco prevention. Welcome, Carla. And last but not least, welcome to Cindy Valencia, who serves as Operations Director for California Quits at the UC Davis Center for Healthcare Policy and Research and brings unique experience in addressing tobacco use in California's Latino population and in partnering with California's Medicaid program, otherwise known as Medi-Cal, to support tobacco cessation. We are so fortunate to have this group with us today to share their perspectives with you all on how to better target cessation efforts to address tobacco use and help people enjoy healthier lives. And so now um, it is my great pleasure to turn the mic over to Keith for a look into the really disturbing history of tobacco marketing to the black community in the United States and to share some implications for more equitable policies moving forward. So Keith, it's all yours. Great, well, thank you so much for the invitation um, to uh, be here today. And hold on, I'm just going to try to... Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. Um, you know, we, this was planned many months ago, uh, but many of us understood that the FDA had promised that by the end of April, they would be making a decision with regard to the menthol cigarette and sure enough, they delivered. Um, I was discussing the long history of menthol cigarettes on a broadcast radio show a couple of days ago. And one of the questions that was put to me is what will people who currently smoke menthol cigarettes do? Uh, which is of course the highlights the significance of the question of targeted cessation practices. Of course, the menthol ban is also about preventing future generations from initiating smoking. What I'd like to do today is to describe a little bit about how we got to this point uh, where the menthol cigarette is being banned. Um, and in 10 short slides, give you a sense of um, how it is that markets have been built up and in some ways to learn from the practices of the industry as we try to undo menthol, undo the sort of the history of cool in smoking. So one of the things to understand is that the, the rise of menthol smoking did not start as a, a racial preference, not at all. In fact, uh, about 100 years ago in 1926 and then in 1933, um, the menthol deception started um, in an effort to convince smokers who were suffering from what was called smoker's throat that mentholated cigarettes carried a kind of therapeutic value. Uh, now, th that is that distinctive feeling of coolness that pervades the nose, the throat, the mucous membranes whenever we eat a product that has menthol or inhale menthol. It's a deceptive sense because it doesn't really change the um, the, it doesn't alter congestion or it's not a decongestant, although it was promised as such. It isn't really a form of relief. Uh, it doesn't in, enhance the uh, capacity to breathe. It doesn't expand airways. But the menthol brands emerged, Cool and Spud, in this space promising smokers who were upset and who were ailing and suffering from what they called smoker's throat because of the harshness of their usual cigarettes, a break cigarette, a chance to step away from your regular cigarette and take what a cool promise to be a kind of therapeutic break. Do you have smoker's throat? Switch from cools, from hots to cools, or as the, uh, mascot for cools suggested when April showers make you cough like crazy, refreshing cools taste fresh as a daisy. Got a cough, switch from hots to cools. And this was a regular feature of their campaigns for much of the first half of the 20th century into the 1950s. In fact, even in the 1950s, when the first linkages between smoking cigarettes and cancer first appeared in epidemiological studies, the industry learned that menthols and filtered cigarettes signified to smokers something um, uh, healthy and safe. Uh, as one industry analyst pointed out, um, the so-called cancer scare, and they often called it the cancer scare to kind of diminish its significance, is a psychological factor that no one can evaluate accurately, changing the type rather than the volume of smoking. And so the industry sponsored many studies like this um, by uh, pollsters, by psychologists, and by others, people like Ernest Dichter working for the Institute um, for Motivational Research, 
identifying the role of psychology in ex that, that expanded in its, um, the role of psychologists expanded in advising the industry as to how to navigate these shifts in habits and attitudes. And it's this era that began to identify the rising appeal of mentholated smoking for those who were concerned about the health implications that were brought to the surface with the new epidemiology. And so menthols in the 1950s were regarded as an ideal product for people susceptible to these kinds of health anxieties. So Ernest Dichter, for instance, writing in 1961, if, if you really looked at the literature from the 1960s that was done on behalf of the industry, they identified different kinds of markets for um, both shifting brands, but also cigarette smoking. The youth market was really important and mentholated smoking, for instance, by Salem's, um, the Salem's that were brought out by, uh, by uh, RJR were seen as one of the growth markets, the youth market. The older market seemed to shift to these older products like Cool. And then um, there was what was called the Negro status seeking market. And I just want to read you some of these documents because it gives you a sense of the intimate way in which markets were built with an attention to changing social currents of the time. In this country, wrote uh, Dichter, the Negro market in particular has been a fruitful outlet for many status products. The natural desire to achieve equality, this is after all the era of civil rights activism, in every way possible has promoted, prompted the Negro consumer to the extensive purchase of all these, those products which are seen as being indicative of a raised socioeconomic and cultural level. Filtered cigarettes represent such a product. In 1961, if you ask industry insiders whether menthol cigarettes had a particular racial appeal, most of them would look at you quizzically. They wouldn't understand even the question because it was clear to them that menthol had a youth appeal and it had a health appeal, but no one really thought in terms of racial appeals. It's in the 1960s that you begin to see a deliberate bend of menthol marketing, cool first, followed by Salem cigarettes. And here you see a chart that chronicles the, the rapid upsurge in, um, in, in, in mentholated cigarette smoking at a time when these new cancer worries, the second Surgeon General's report coming out in 1964. And, and particularly one of the key reasons for the shift of the industry towards urban African-American oriented marketing was the federal regulators increasing scrutiny of the industry's um, marketing efforts on, on colleges and in youth. So threatened with this kind of increasingly um, fierce regulation, frankly, of outreach to young people, particularly on television, uh, which is a new medium in the 1950s, industry turns in the 1960s to increasing um, marketing in cities. And they used the same strategy they'd used for many decades, the use of focus groups, psychographic studies, street corner interviews to understand social status anxiety, health worries, gender concerns, perceptions of self uh, and other to inform advertising, placement as well as marketing. Now, I should point out that, you know, it's not exclusively a black themed advertising. So for instance, one of the companies that really never uh, built a successful menthol uh, product was Philip Morris after pivoting and creating a very masculine Marlboro cigarette in 1950s, which had been a kind of a feminine brand. Uh, they tried to do the same with Alpine and they were unsuccessful, but here's an example of their efforts to masculinize, masculinize menthol smoking in this time period. But these are the kinds of efforts that ultimately gained traction in the 1960s. This is the image on the front of my book, and this is the Bronzeville section of Chicago in the mid-1960s, featuring Elston Howard, the first uh, African-American to play for the New York Yankees in the 1960s as the spokesperson for coming up to the cool taste of cool menthol. Or this image in the 1970s, a much more kind of opinionated uh, Black image of the cool smoker. I want to give you a quick sense of how these markets were built, because it's not just in the, um, on, on the corners of street corners with signs. There's actually a lot of back of um, sort of behind the curtain activities, which is only visible because 
1998, the state's attorneys general and the Department of Justice sued the industry for many of these practices. And what resulted is the discovery process that made many of these kinds of documents available, which is what really has allowed me to write the book that I did. And here's a document I really uh, like to talk about because it shows you the ways in which the industry sought to find influencers. Uh, this is a study that was done for the industry by Dancer Fitzgerald and Sample, a consulting firm, studying Black St. Louis, uh, engage and, and how to engage in a particularly secretive predatory strain of building markets. It's a study, as they say, uh, for some thoughts on how to reach the Negro market for camel menthols. Uh, in Negro areas of St. Louis. They talk about tapping generational tensions that Negroes in the 1960s, there's a generational politics that they're tapping into, don't want what daddy used to smoke or drink, that's old fashioned. They talk about the need to appeal to black pride and rejecting white standards. The Negroes no longer look to the white market and its purchasing norms to set the pace in what to buy. Again, Negroes are becoming increasingly proud of the fact that they're Negroes and they're, not reject, they're now rejecting uh, many of the standards or patterns set by the white community. But it's this feature of the document that I wanna highlight, which is the idea of how do you find centers of influence. This is kind of behavioral psychology before behavioral psychology existed as a field. As this document says, in both working and social situations, Negroes tend to gravitate to groups, and Negro men usually spend more time with their respective groups than the average white man, whether it be bars or club meetings or the street, on the street or at their jobs. Within these groups, there are centers of influence, individuals who lead the others because they are, quote, either more in the know or they're more forceful. These are not leaders in the sense of being president of the PTA or a local civic organization. They could be a barber, a numbers man, a bellhop, a bartender, a taxi driver who likes to show how smart he is with his pals and associates. They're kingfishes. And these are the best means of spreading news. They have a strong desire themselves for status and class. And our job is to deliver to them what was called boast material, that is free samples. Um, to these cell groups, we must impart prestige and factual knowledge in a personalized, almost secret manner, in addition to the product itself. And we must aim this promotional effort at the leaders and communicators within the Negro cell groups, this boast material that allows them to show that they're in the know, to brag to friends about having insider information. Now, it's this pattern of both, you might say, behind the curtain building of markets that I document in the book, but I also document the rise of um, the way in which um, efforts to curtail tobacco's reach into communities. So, for instance, the banning of uh, television and radio ads in 1970 also produced an upsurge in local billboard advertising kind of targeted even more forcefully into black urban settings than ever before. So we might say government tries to prevent marketing and outreach in certain areas like banning outreach to youth, but that only redoubles the industry's efforts to reach urban black um, consumers. When national advertising on radio and television is banned, this also drives the industry even more forcefully into cities. And by the 1980s, you begin to see, and it's not that, that opposition didn't exist before, but in the 1980s in particular, you begin to see activism against these trends. Uh, one of the, my favorite characters in the book is a man named Henry McNeil Brown who called himself Mandrake. And one of the things he did was an act of vigilantism in the 1980s. He would whitewash and blackwash billboards in Chicago, which he saw as illegitimate means of trying to reach uh, African-American youth, selling what he calls drugs of illusion. In the 1980s, you also have community activists and public health adv advocates increasingly speaking out against these trends. But, um, and, and I want to, that brings us to a story in uh, 1990 Philadelphia, in which RJR begins to launch a new product called Uptown. Uh, this in many ways is a turning point because it exposes many of these industry tactics. It highlights the existence of hidden supporters that allow this practice, these practices to thrive and succeed. And in some ways laid the groundwork for what we have today, which is 
the movement, the growing movement to ban menthol cigarettes. And uh, there's some unlikely characters, uh, for instance, um, Louis Sullivan, the Health and Human Services Secretary of George Herbert Walker Bush in a Republican administration who would be aligned against these kinds of targeted practices. So just very briefly, the Uptown controversy is one in which R.J. Reynolds announces in late 1989 and 1990 that it's going to launch a new brand called Uptown, uh, and they're going to test market it only in Black areas in Philadelphia. And unlike other brands that are marketed for every, everyone, they're going to proudly advertise this as a Black exclusive menthol brand, uh, and they're going to push it exclusively in, in, in Philadelphia. Uh, what they run up against is an unlikely foe uh, in a business-friendly administration. Uh, Louis Sullivan, who is an African-American physician, uh, the founding dean of Morehouse, and who is Health and Human Services Secretary in the, the, the Bush administration, the Bush one administration, who comes out forcefully against this, arguing that Upstown's message is more disease, more suffering, more death for a group already bearing more than its share of smoking-related illness and mortality. Now, what is striking about this, and I devote an entire chapter really to this uh, tension, is how the industry manages to succeed in securing menthol markets by turning to unlikely supporters. Um, they turn at this time to Benjamin Hooks, the executive director of the NAACP, who was formerly part of uh, the FCC under the Nixon administration, and as Newsweek points out, civil rights activist Ben, ben Hook sees it as a form of paternalism to, 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 um, to ban billboards or to criticize RGR for this outreach. He argued that buried in this line of thinking that billboards like this should be banned or outreach like this is illegitimate is the rationale that Blacks are not capable of making up their own free choice. His comments reflect the reluctance of some Black groups to attack tobacco companies, which have donated money to support events and causes ranging from uh, jazz festivals to United Negro College Fund and also at this point the NAACP. So the message here is that you know here's here are two black public officials who are speaking in different ways about the future of African-American health. Now one of the wonderful things about this story is that Lewis Sullivan's argument prevailed. They could the RGR really could not handle the kind of outrage that resulted from him calling out the brand and their tactics uh, by name specifically. And they ultimately pulled um, the, the, they pulled the campaign. But these allies in uh, the black community that are financed by industry continue to kind of prevail on behalf of the industry. So to understand why it is that we are debating the ban on the menthol cigarette, and I'll end with this in one more slide, um, and why the FDA has just acted, we need to go back to understand that for most of the 20th century and for all the 20th century up until 2009, the FDA had no jurisdiction over tobacco products at all, which is itself remarkable and says something about the power of the tobacco industry. But this changed in 2009 when Obama became president and the Democrats took over Congress. And one of the byproducts of this was the passage of the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, which did two things. It handed FDA authority for the first time over tobacco products, and it banned all flavored cigarettes, well, almost all flavored cigarettes. Menthol cigarettes remained legal and were exempted from this ban. And the question of what to do about menthol was punted to the FDA, which has been trying to make this determination for more than a decade. The reason why menthol wasn't banned is a familiar story, which is uh, it hinges on tobacco company endorsement and financing of campaign donations for really well-placed uh, elected officials like Edolphus Towns of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, as New York Times reported in July of 2008, Blacks in Congress were split. The Congressional Black Caucus was split with people like Edolphus Towns working on behalf of the industry and arguing that to ban menthols would somehow be discriminatory against African Americans. And those who, um, who argued that, you know, really menthols were a historical attempt to exploit African Americans. And Henry Waxman, who was a major architect of this legislation, was unwilling to risk the bill's overall passage. And so this is why the question of what to do about menthols was punted to the FDA, where it tried to act twice before, 
And in some ways, this is the third time around. Now, the tobacco industry has not been silent, and this is where I'll end, because one of the things they try to do is to mobilize, just as they did with Benjamin Hooks, a kind of a rhetoric of Black self-determination to fight against and to call attention to the dangers of banning menthol cigarettes. Uh, as the New York, uh, the Los Angeles Times highlighted uh, last week, uh, Big Tobacco has been using, for instance, the idea of George Floyd and Eric Garner, Eric Garner strangling on the street corner in, Saint, uh, in Staten Island selling Lucy cigarettes. Uh, they've tried to elevate the specter of African Americans uh, engaged in bootleg menthol uh, use that will fall under surveillance by, physician, by, by, by um, uh, police and as a result produce more Eric uh, Garners and more George Floyds. Now, of course, this is the kind of familiar, this is fr really from the, uh, the, the playbook. It takes a legitimate uh, criminal justice and civil rights issue and tries to tie it to the fate of a lucrative product that the industry is trying to support. And also finding individuals like um, Reverend Al Sharpton, who takes campaign funds from the tobacco industry to support this argument. What I do in the, uh, the last, this is my last slide in my book, is to highlight that they, these advocates, these so-called advocates for Black health and well-being, have the story wrong. In fact, you know, menthols have been not, you know, it, menthols won't produce more people like Eric Garner um, crying, I can't breathe, under the assault of physicians. In fact, menthols are part of the history of I can't breathe. That is to say, insofar as COVID uh, has manifested disproportionate health uh, implications for Blacks, insofar as police violence also, menthols are also part of a long history of systemic targeting of African Americans that lead not over minutes, as in the case of Mr. Floyd, not all over weeks and months, as in the case of COVID, but over decades in the crippling uh, of the lungs, emphysema, lung cancer, and a wide range of other ailments that end in the same place with people crying, I can't breathe. The only difference, of course, is that much of the story that I've described there is not caught on a video. It's not uh, something that you can see graphically and understand who the perpetrators are. And one of the reasons for writing this book is to bring to light some of these trends and to explain for those who are interested in both the ban on menthol cigarettes on all, also on cessation, exactly what we've been up against over the last multiple decades of how these markets have been built and how they have been sustained and who the allies and uh, who the sort of who the problem, where the problem has resided over the course of decades. So I'll end there. Uh, I think I've talked a little bit too long, but I think that gives you a sense of the challenges uh, in past and the challenges looking ahead. Keith, thank you so much uh, for that. And um, you, you couldn't have gone long enough. I think we're, um, uh, it, it's, it's incredibly powerful to learn those lessons from history and the way you weave them together into where we are today and make those connections is uh, quite poignant. So thank you so much for sharing this research and work with us. Um, and now I would love to invite, uh, excuse me, invite our, um, our panelists to join us on video um, so that we can engage together in conversation. And I trust that you're, um, despite uh, familiarity um, with the story, it's, um, it's quite powerful for all of us to hear uh, Keith tell it and summarize it in, in the way you did. So thank you again. And, um, 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 and, and now we're just going to jump right in. And um, again, there are instructions for submitting questions. Um, I can't promise we'll get to all of them. I'll encourage our panelists to type in responses as you see fit and to include um, uh, you know, uh, responses to the questions that come in from the audience in your overall remarks as we go. Um, and if we can add some at the end, uh, even better. So Carla, I am going to start with you. Um, we, we just heard... Um, about the long history of racially targeted cigarette marketing in the, in the US. I have two questions for you. One, what are the implications on the prevalence of smoking in the black community and the um, associated disease burden? And second, how does this shape the CDC's imperative to address disparities in tobacco use and cessation? 
Thank you. Thank you, Allison. And, and, and let me start by just uh, thanking uh, CHCS for inviting our participation today and for putting together this wonderful webinar. We appreciate your partnership so much. Uh, Dr. Weilu, what a wonderful presentation. And I was just sitting there. I see Sally shaking her head, thinking about when I first started, uh, very first early days of my working in um, commercial tobacco control, one of the very first, if not the very first case history study, activism, teaching us, you know, how to do this work was the Uptown <laughs> campaign. And Reverend Jesse uh, uh, Je uh, Brown, uh, who was a, a Black minister in Philadelphia, was one of the activists on the ground that just taught so many of us uh, uh, to appreciate what was happening at the community level. And, and I loved what you said, behind the curtain, what was going on behind the curtain. It, thank you very much for, for sharing that story. Um, as Allison stated in her opening, cigarette uh, smoking still remains as the nation's leading cause of preventable disease and death, not just for the general public, but for Black Americans and for many other uh, populations. And sadly, uh, we're still losing over 16 million Americans every day, or every, um, I'm, I'm sorry, we still have 16 million Americans that have a disease caused by smoking, and we're losing nearly a half million, 480,000 Americans every year from smoking. I think, you know, what, what these statistics don't tell, of course, is the whole story that really is driving our work at the Office on C uh, Smoking and Health at CDC. And that's our priority to really uh, advance toward health equity, which has been uh, far too long in coming. And it, it's really about us identifying and eliminating the drivers of inequities and disparities in commercial tobacco use and exposures. And to really dig down and say, you know, where, how did we get here? And I think your story, Dr. Waylu, really demonstrated um, how this industry uh, had capitalized on, um, in, you know, the story and the context of the community. Um, so it's, 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 it's um, sad, but it's also at this point in our time a great opportunity right now for us to make great advances. And that's what we have to do. We have to take the opportunities and make great advances. Uh, since the first Surgeon General's report back in 64, uh, unjust and unfair practices and policies have disproportionately impacted population groups, including Black Americans. And this has resulted in, the, in a higher use of tobacco products, higher exposures also to secondhand smoke, and also uh, less likelihood of having access to the evidence-based approaches to help people quit, to be able to get the help to quit, to know that there are medications there that will work and to understand uh, not just access to them, but the messages from the right people that can encourage people to use those, those products. Um, I think, you know, I, I do wanna say that these disparities run across many, many groups. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the uh, one of the great opportunities with the the new proposal by the FDA with banning uh, menthol with a menthol regulation is that this has an opportunity to affect so many. We know that menthol products uh, represent about a third of the tobacco products that are sold in this country. So it you can just see the mammoth opportunity that we have for impacting the lives of Americans. Uh, menthol has, uh, as cigarettes have contributed uh, to disparities for decades. And these companies, as you've demonstrated, have just uh, latched on and, and marketed so aggressively in, in our communities. Um, so I think, uh, you know, if we're truly going to reduce tobacco use in this country, uh, we have to take the opportunities when we, w that we have, like right now, with an opportunity to ban menthol in cigarettes. There's also another 
opportunity, which is related to cigars, and that's banning all flavors and cigars, which includes the little cigars, the ones that you see, you know, when you walk out of the convenience store and you see the two little cigars, grape flavored, available for 99 cents, that's what I'm talking about. And that's an opportunity with with these new proposals as well. So I, I, I'll end there um, that to just to say we have a great opportunity before us to tackle uh, the greatest cause of preventable death and disease in this country. Uh, thank you so much um, for for sharing all all of those insights and you know the perspective of your team at the CDC on this work. And I want to bring Del Monte into this conversation. Del Monte, you've dedicated a substantial part of your professional career to these issues. Um, and one of the questions actually that came in from the audience as I'm trying to multitask here and, and monitor those as well, um, I, I think speaks to um, something that, that we've talked about in, in preparation for today and specifically around uh, culturally appropriate um, community specific cessation approaches. And so, you know, um, I would love to hear your just reflections on the, on the conversation so far, um, on the opportunities that you see coming down the pike in the context of the ban. Um, and, you know, what, what should we all be doing about this, um, given the opportunities at hand? So please share, share some of your thoughts with us. Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me. And let me just say, I have had the absolute pleasure of, of working with and working under and working together with some of those same folks that, that started this movement, that were there. The, the Jesse Browns, who, who sat on our board of directors, and, and Sharon Sutton, who, of course, you know, was right there for the Uptown movement. And Bob Robinson, of course, who worked at CDC, but also was right there in the middle of the movement. And Bill Robinson at Napton, who, who worked with, who wrote the letter to Lewis Sullivan saying, hey, look, we've got to do something in 2009 when menthol was excluded. So, and, and, and the folks right now, the pioneers in this work, uh, Dr. Phil Gardner, Carol Magruder, Dr. Valerie Yerger, the folks who have tirelessly crisscrossed the country, crisscrossed the country, trying to get policies banned, uh, to ban the sale of mentholated tobacco products. And so I've, I've been blessed. And as Carla said, you know, this is an opportunity because we have been talking this and Carla would tell you, they, you know, some folks didn't want to hear us saying this sometimes because we were saying it so much. And I'm, I'm talking back 10 plus years ago, we were saying it so much, but we kept saying it. And, and now, you know, to see everyone saying it, it's, it's a blessing to see folks, as Carla said, focus on equity. And, and that's the issue that we're dealing with. That's the, the, the targeting of African-Americans and other priority populations with menthol cigarettes. That's an equity issue. That's a social justice issue that we are trying to address. And we are trying to address it with equity-centered policies, policies that are going to benefit those that they are intended to. And as Carla said, you know, we got some policies out there. We had some smoke-free policies out there that didn't benefit black children. Black children were still suffering even though we had policies, but now we're getting to policies that are gonna benefit you know, those folks that are intended to. And if African-Americans are smoking more of the mentholated tobacco products, then we're gonna have policies, policies that are gonna try and curve that. Now, how do we get those policies? We build capacity, we develop infrastructure. What do we mean by build? And that's what we did in Philadelphia with Uptown. We built community capacity, we built community confidence, and they resisted and they spoke with their voice and that subcomment was pushed back. It wasn't pushed back because the tobacco industry said, oh, it might be the right thing to do. It was pushed back because those advocates, Sharon, Jesse, they said, Bob, they said, no, we can't do this. We don't want this in our communities. So we built capacity. We talk about the history. We talk about the culture. We talk about the geography. We talk about the context. And then we get those communities involved but they can't get too heavily involved without adequate resources. And that's the infrastructure piece. That's when we're saying, let's put our resources where our mouth is. We wanna deal with equity. We've gotta put resources in there to deal with equity. We can't just say, hey, this isn't right. We gotta put those resources in there to build in that capacity and develop in that community infrastructure. And that might be uh, media work. That might be educational campaigns that might be cessation, culturally appropriate cessation. Now understand this, the tobacco industry targeted specific populations. 
they had the messages to target those populations. Well, our cessation efforts have to equally be culturally appropriate to target specific populations. We've got to have messages that resonate because the reasons that one population smokes, again, we're talking about history, geography, culture, and context, the reason that one population smokes could be different. When you look at systemic racism, when you look at the inequalities, when you look at the housing, the reasons that some African-Americans are smoking is different than others. And so your cessation protocols have to be able to address that and recognize that. Now, there were some tools that came out back in the early days. Pathways to Freedom <clears throat> is a primary example. It was developed, it was culturally appropriate. It's a cessation resource. CDC developed this, um, Bob Robinson over at CDC helped develop this, and it was a tool that was used, and it was reformatted, and, and it was upped, re ended it up um, by Dr. Monica Webb Hooper, and this is a DVD, and we have access to that DVD on our website, the Pathways to Freedom DVD, and it talks about, you know, menthol, it talks about the targeting of the population. It talks about the reasons why African Americans are smoking and how you need to address it. So you got to have culturally appropriate resources. And you got to have an, an event, in my opinion, like No Menthol Sunday, which is coming up the third Sunday in May, the third Sunday, the weekend after Mother's Day. So we celebrate our mothers and then we celebrate our freedom from smoking on No Menthol Sunday. And it's a faith-based holiday. So we, we talk about from the pulpit, from different churches, the need for cessation, the need for quitting, and the need for getting involved in efforts to, again, ban the sale of menthol products um, in your communities. Now, the last thing I want to say is the FDA's rule. The FDA's ruling doesn't happen if thou from the lawsuit filed by the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. Let's, let's be real. They may have gotten to it eventually. They may have done it. But when the citizens petition was filed back in 2013, saying, FDA, you've got enough information to act, the FDA said, we're going to act. They didn't act, though. They acted like they were going to act, but they didn't act. So it wasn't until in 2020 when a lawsuit was filed by the AATCLC that was later joined by the Action on Smoking and Health and also joined by the American Medical Association and the National Medical Association. It wasn't until that lawsuit was filed that the FDA was compelled to respond to the lawsuit, which led to them announcing last year on April 2019, a day that's a holiday in my opinion, we celebrate April 2019, that's when they announced that they were going to ban menthol. And of course, just last week, you know, with the actual rulemaking process coming out. So we are so thankful for these advocates, um, both then and now, that have led us to this moment. But we know and recognize that it's not over, that we still got to continue in this work and in this fight. Thanks. Lamonte, thank you so much. And what I love about your response just now is you reminded us that um, there's, you know, the, the history of the perpetrators on the one hand, and there's the history of the um, of the, the activists and um, the leaders that brought us to the moment that we are now. And we can kid ourselves sometimes that these things, you know, happen in a moment. Um, but as you just described, uh, these, these efforts are decades in, in the making. And um, I just want to um, offer gratitude, I'm sure on behalf of the, the panel and our audience um, for the tenacity um, and the sort of um, full court press on these issues and not and not letting up all these years um, to get us where we are today. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I see my colleagues have posted um, uh, information in the chat. Um, Dalmonte mentioned other resources available on his organization's website, and we'll make sure to get those around to folks as well, because uh, we're eager to um, share the established best practices in these areas. So thank you so much. Cindy, I'm going to turn to you now, bring you into the conversation and, and pivot a little bit. Um, your work touches on a different angle of culturally appropriate cessation, and that is among California's Latino community. From your work, um, we'd love to hear about some practical strategies that are effective at helping people quit, um, particularly in a culturally appropriate context, and how your work has supported a person-centered approach for cessation to help reduce use and the associated disparities. So welcome any insights you want to share with us. 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to join in on this conversation. Del Monte, thank you so much for highlighting the need to make sure that health equity is truly at the heart of future conversations and policies in order to address tobacco-related disparities. I am here representing California Quits today, a project funded by the California Department of Public Health. It's a tobacco control program. It was established in 2018. My mentor and principal investigator on this project is Dr. Eliza Tong. My research focus is on understanding tobacco-related disparities among low-income Latino populations. It is important to understand unique smoking behaviors and healthcare utilization practices among priority populations in order to inform tailored tobacco cessation interventions. In California, there are an estimated 3 million smokers and a third are Latino. Additionally, one in three Californians are on Medi-Cal and Medi-Cal members are more likely to smoke. Access to health insurance coverage in healthcare services, including tobacco cessation treatment, is a known barrier among Latinos. But it was hoped that through Medicaid expansion, things would improve. Unfortunately, according to our research, that was not the case. Our recent study published in JAMA Network shows California Latino smokers with Medi-Cal continue to report less provider advice and assistance to quit than non-Latino white smokers. The factors associated with provider advice to quit are greater number of office visits and having a chronic disease, while the factors associated with provider cessation assistance is daily smoking. So even with health insurance, Medicaid health insurance, there may be missed opportunities to discuss the health benefits of quitting smoking and the options for tobacco treatment. For populations who are less likely to visit a physician, such as Latinos, Medi-Cal plans and healthcare systems might consider community engagement and proactive outreach uh, strategies outside of that clinical encounter or that build on that clinical encounter to help direct individuals to evidence-based state quitline services. For populations who might be light or non-daily smokers, such as Latinos, healthcare systems may consider implementing tobacco screening protocols that ask about use in the past 30 days. That might be a way to capture non-daily smokers and try to direct them to evidence-based services. In terms of communication messages and channels, it's important to understand the community. For the Latino community, um, community-based messages that focus on the harms of secondhand smoke exposure um, to the family might be motivating messages. It's also important to leverage community leaders and promotoras or lay workers. That might be an effective channel to convey health uh, messages. Um, it's going to take a multi-level approach and a simultaneous approach um, to promote cessation services outside of that clinical encounter. Um, this may include written messages or, or in-home mailings um, with information about nicotine replacement therapy. Um, these are proven strategies in California's Medi-Cal population, and this resonated well with Spanish-speaking Latinos. This notion of sending out mailings with information about um, incentivizing um, nicotine replacement therapy um, directly into the home for Medicaid population was an effective strategy. Cindy, thank you so much. Lots of good fodder um, in there and, you know, a, a repetition of this theme of, of trusted messengers um, and, and culturally specific um, and trusted, trusted messaging. Um, so really appreciate you um, bringing that into and reinforcing some of those themes in the conversation. And Sally, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, sitting in the state of North Carolina, the nation's leading producer of tobacco, and I'll say I uh, spent years in the 90s living in North Carolina, and I remember smelling tobacco um, from the factories back in those days. And um, it's a particularly um, unique vantage point to be doing the work that you're doing um, in, that, in that geography and region. Um, you've long been involved in efforts to reduce tobacco use. Can you talk about effective state level strategies to reduce tobacco use, particularly in black communities? Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be a part of this panel. Um, it's such a timely opportunity for us in this nation. 
Um, and yes, I work in North Carolina, my home state, uh, in tobacco control, and we do face many challenges that are created by the political power that the tobacco industry yields in our state. For example, the North Carolina General Assembly preempted the executive branch and local governments on point of sale regulations way back in 1997, and those preemptions are still in effect today. North Carolina cigarettes are sold relatively cheaply here as our state tax is 48th in the nation. Um, and in order to advance health equity and eliminate commercial tobacco product related health inequities and disparities in African American communities, we really must work together with multi level leaders, partners, and communities where we can join hands, educate, and combine our strengths. For example, we have been able to overcome a state law that preempted strong smoke free regulations, which uh, were something that particularly put African American communities at risk. And now we have one of the strongest uh, smoke free restaurants and bars laws in the nation, uh, especially in the tobacco south where smoke free regulations uh, uh, in restaurants and bars are fairly rare. And we have many smoke free regulations in local communities. Our policies project also worked to protect some of the most vulnerable populations, including African American families and children that are really at higher risk from exposure to secondhand smoke than other populations, um, as well as e-cigarette emissions. Now we're working to educate our state, our leaders, especially our African American leaders about the dangers of menthol and to prepare comments for the FDA's proposed uh, product standards. And I will certainly use this uh, recording to help us do that. Um, these actions really have the potential to significantly reduce uh, disease and death from combusted tobacco product use, the leading cause of preventable death in North Carolina and the nation, by reducing youth experimentation and addiction and increasing the number of tobacco users who quit. And we look forward to being able to work with partners to do targeted messaging, just as Del Monte was recommending, that, and finding the right kinds of partners to message in our communities. Finally, we're working with an interagency group on uh, that is planning and bringing together North Carolina uh, partners to bring us into compliance with the federal Tobacco 21 law. This includes permitting or as some states say, licensure to help protect young people. Tobacco 21 laws raise the minimum age to purchase tobacco products from 18 to 21 and puts in place important measures to place such a measure uh, as uh, that is effective in protecting our young folks. Of particularly importance is this licensing and permitting of tobacco retailers as a tool to help protect young people from uh, tobacco use. 40 states, including Southern tobacco states such as Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia have such a law and North Carolina needs this law too. We're working hard on that with partners. Thank you, Sally, and good luck with your continued efforts there. Um, Keith, um, you've, you've heard a lot from your, your fellow panelists at this point. Just wanna pause and um, welcome you to offer any reflections um, on what your colleagues have shared thus far, particularly that, that resonate with you given all of the research you've done on these issues. Yeah, I mean, these are wonderful uh, presentations, and uh, I, 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 everything that is said, I completely agree with, and I applaud all of the efforts. Um, it strikes me that what I'm hearing is that uh, this is a really important moment, but it's really just another chapter in what has been and will be an ongoing effort. And what I'm hearing is the importance of a kind of a multi-front approach to thinking about smoking cessation, um, whether it has to do with, okay, how do you, what are the, in, what are the infrastructure issues that we need to actually advance smoking cessation? It's not just a simple thing of saying you should stop smoking, right? It has to do with coverage. It has to do with implementing actual, um, like nicotine prevention, like explaining and communicating using resources, what the nicotine prevention steps might be, but thinking as both um, uh, 
uh, Del Monte and Cindy have said about culturally appropriate messaging. I mean, these are tactics that the industry has used to their own um, benefit. Thinking about um, one of the interesting things that I think puts us at a disadvantage when we're thinking about smoking cessation is the industry is very good at, at getting others to do their work for them, finding influencers. Because if people knew that like the industry was behind these efforts, they would not be as willing to take up these practices. The disadvantage we have is, you know, often it's somebody um, who has your best interest in mind saying, you know, you really shouldn't go in this direction or here are the avenues you can take um, to quit smoking. And we, we, it, it puts also, it puts a lot of programs at a disadvantage. And so finding, as uh, I think someone mentioned, people who are invested with, and with authority in communities to speak on behalf of the health and well-being of the Black or Latinx community. These are some of the strategies, but it, it, takes, it takes resources to do that. Uh, and the last thing I'd say is that strategies that might work for this generation or this year may not work in five years. So it's not a one-time solution. Uh, but I do think that the opportunity we have right now is that the ban on menthols has, uh, and the, the predicted fruition of the ban on menthols has opened up a question of what are people to do who currently smoke menthol cigarettes. And so in some ways it's opened up a really important question about the avenues towards smoking cessation, not just prevention of initiation of smoking. And this is a moment when I do think that we can learn from Medi-Cal, that um, Medicaid programs can learn from each other. And there is a, there's an opportunity to create new structures to address the needs of precisely this moment. Thanks so much for that, Keith. And um, that leads me um, to Carla. Um, given the uh, tremendous expertise and capacity that the CDC has um, to bring to this effort. Um, and so, you know, the CDC has done such extensive work already to identify effective strategies to support cessation. Can you tell us more, um, you know, in the spirit of um, uh, you know, Keith's description of, of the, the opportunity that we have and the need that we have before us right now, um, particularly as, um, you know, 30% of um, uh, tobacco use um, is, you know, on the precipice of looking for a cessation um, service to ameliorate the impacts of the ban. Um, can you tell us a, a little bit more about how CDC works in general with states and communities to implement evidence-based interventions to support cessation and, and how you're thinking about this moment in that context. Helps if I open my mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely. And uh, this, is a perf this was a perfect setup to talk about the resources and the programs that, that we work on through the, the Office on Smoking and Health. The first thing I'll say is we don't do anything that uh, we have not found to be uh, rooted in, in the science and the data. And even if it's a promising practice that we're investigating or evaluating, we come at that from the data to show us that we need to be doing something different. For example, messaging with the right kind of messaging for specific populations. That's just one example. So, so our national and state tobacco control program at, uh, at the Office on Smoking and Health is just one of our programs. Uh, it happens to be the program that I manage in, in our branch. And of course, I can talk about it all day long, but I'm going to be brief. <laughs> it is a program that we fund. And in fact, um, uh, we fund the, this, this program in all 50 states, D.C., uh, eight uh, territory, U.S. territories and federally recognized uh, uh, freely associated states, a network of tribes and tribal serving organizations. And we also fund a network of uh, national networks of which 
The Center for Black Health and Equity is one that address tobacco-related disparities and cancer prevention disparities. So uh, this is the bulk of our community and local work. And we are really uh, working to build an infrastructure in these the states and the other entities that I mentioned so that they can build the capacity and infrastructure to do comprehensive work. Uh, we're actually the only federal agency that funds this kind of work in all 50 states. So there's a Sally in, a, in every state. And if you'd like to find the Sally in your state, or you'd like to find the quit line like Cindy is talking about in California, we're gonna put a link into the chat that will take you to the Tobacco Control Network, which is a network of all of the Sallies in the world, uh, in the United States. And you can click on your state and find out who is that state program manager. Talk, you know, shoot them an email, talk to them. I know they would love to hear from you if you have not already been connected. So what we know is that states that have the greatest investments uh, produce the greatest uh, declines in commercial tobacco use. And I'd, I'd like to just take a moment and talk about what that means, comprehensive. I know that, you know, when I was in the at the state level, uh, I always got the question from decision makers, you know, what's the single best thing that we can do? We can't do everything. Well, the single best thing you can do is make sure that you take a comprehensive approach to this problem because it is complex and it takes a comprehensive approach. And that's why we developed uh, CDC's best practices on comprehensive state and local tobacco control programs. This came about back in the late 90s when the uh, Master Settlement Agreement came about, and there was more money at the state level. Unfortunately, there's not as much there today, which is uh, another story. And maybe Dr. Wei Lu, we can encourage, we can, we can, you know, encourage you to write that story too. <laughs> um, and, but a comprehensive approach is really what it takes. Cessation is one element of that comprehensive approach. And, you know, and it's very closely linked. So these are all pieces that are interlocked together with the infrastructure that you have for a community-based program and a state program in your area. And also very tightly interlocked with the communication structure that you have in order to do strong, hard-hitting messages. So cessation is definitely driven uh, by messaging from hard-hitting uh, public education commit uh, uh, campaigns like tips from former smokers. Uh, we are in the 10th year of tips. You've probably seen it on TV. It's on there right now. It's running in every single market in the United States. Unfortunately, we only have enough funding to run it for seven months. We'd love to be able to be running that 12 months a year. And we'd love for every state and community to be running their own campaigns that are with targeted messages to reach those specific uh, individuals who are, are using tobacco products with the messages that they need to hear with the messengers that they need to hear. One last thing I want to say about state and community programs. This is really where the education about evidence-based policy work happens. And uh, you've heard different pieces of that. So I'm gonna pull it together in one piece for you. Uh, it's really um, about having high prices on tobacco. And that comes about through some policies like higher taxes. Uh, and that does drive individuals to make a quit attempt. It comes about through strong smoke-free laws that both Del Monte and Sally talked about. Uh, that helps people to make a quit attempt, it, but it also protects them and especially protects young people from exposure to secondhand smoke. And it comes about through this newer work at the retail level that Sally just mentioned. Uh, we can't also rely just on the regulation that's proposed by FDA. We need to keep doing the hard work at the local level. San Diego just last week passed a comprehensive flavor ban that included menthol. And that's the type of work at the retail level that we need to continue to have along with strong laws that support uh, 
ages of 21 to purchase products, along with regulate uh, policies that will uh, have an impact on where you can sell tobacco and how it looks when you sell it. You know, density, how many of these places can you have? Who can buy there? And, and how far can it be from, um, from schools, for example? So all of these policies work together. And then we need the cessation support uh, to be able to reach people with the kind of cessation. Last thing I'll say, because I know I'm running out of time, is that we have a network of state quit lines in every single state. Uh, Cindy talked about uh, what they've learned in California with a quit line there. And we have uh, funded quit lines in every single state. So if you know someone that needs to make a quit attempt, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. It's free, it's confidential. And most of our states offer a starter kit of NRT for two weeks to help people get started. Thanks. Carla, thank you so much. Um, I think that message of it needs to be a comprehensive sort of multifaceted approach is one that we can all walk away with for sure here. And thank you for all of those really concrete examples of what's comprised in that and what's necessary to make that effective. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of a lightning round here. Um, I would love to turn to each of our remaining panelists um, uh, for maybe up to two minutes of response, if possible, to a, a final question for each of you. Um, and Del Monte, I'll start with you. Um, Carla spoke about these, these national networks and um, you're a part of that. Um, so much of your work has been through regional coalitions and partnerships. Can you tell us, you know, in again, two minutes or less, like what are the, what, what's the guidance you would share in terms of the types of partnerships that have been most effective in this work? Well, yeah, absolutely. The types of partnerships are gonna be those community level, community-based partnerships. That's where the power is. That's where our assets are in those communities. And so to the extent that we are able to develop their capacity and support and increase their infrastructure, that's where our power is going to come from, okay? Um, I do wanna share though, just that example that Carla was talking about, that other example of that collaboration, the TIPS campaign. Did you know that CDC, uh, when we have no menthol Sunday, uh, in the past, in the past, we've upped the, the TIPS advertisements in those select markets where we have high concentrations of African-Americans and where they know we're gonna be doing no menthol Sunday services. Now that's that's powerful. That's that collaboration. That's us working in concert to get the message out and to get those resources out for those communities that might be needing them, that might be wanting to quit. And so that's a powerful example of how you collaborate and how you partner. And so I, I just wanted to put that out there and point that out. But again, communities is where our power is. Communities needs to be where our resources are. When Carla said earlier, she says, the lawmakers, they say, they say, we can't do everything. So what do we need to do? She says comprehensive, because when they say they can't do everything, the first thing that they scratch from their list is disparities. And so it's no wonder why we say, well, wait a minute, now it's our disparate populations that still have the highest smoking rates that investment has not been done in those communities. And so we still have to keep that investment there. We have to stress that and we have to make that our priority. Beautifully and powerfully said, Delmonte. Thank you so much. Sally, I'm gonna to turn to you next in the lightning round. And um, in some of our preparation and the materials we shared back and forth, um, you spoke about some of the opportunities you've had and tried to leverage in connection with the rollout of Medicaid managed care mm -hmm. um, in the state of North Carolina. And would love for you to share um, you know, any concrete things that you're excited about coming out of that collaboration. Yes, this is wonderful timing uh, for our collaboration with uh, Medicaid. We've been working in North Carolina and DHHS for sort of pulling down these silos and building these partnerships from public health to Medicaid to mental health. Because, you know, in the nation, one of those inequities that we've been working on is how hard it is to offer evidence-based tobacco treatment and tobacco-free environments in behavioral health settings. Um, and so that's something we're working on with Medicaid, the Medicaid program. As we move to Medicaid managed care, we will in North Carolina achieve by December 1st of this year uh, that Medicaid clients will have the ability to receive standard of care tobacco treatment and receive that treatment in tobacco-free facilities uh, at the same time as offering 
uh, mental health and substance use disorder treatment. This combination of interventions will improve outcomes not only related to tobacco treatment, but for mental health and substance use disorder treatment as well. Our Medicaid providers uh, will contract with Quitline and C, our Quitline in North Carolina, and we will promote evidence-based tobacco treatment, three things like the tips from former smokers campaign and, uh, and specific ads targeting our populations uh, with tailored programs for African Americans, for people with mental health and substance use disorders, for American Indians, uh, with pregnant women, and for young people who vape and the adults who care about them. And this really meets the needs of Medicaid clients who have never had easy access to tobacco treatment through their or other caregivers. Um, and then finally, if you want a really good snapshot of what's going on in, in North Carolina, um, take a look at Breathe Easy NC. That is our coalition that's working with Medicaid and our Division of Mental Health. Um, and we would love for you to see a special focus from our Mecklenburg County, uh, North Carolina Change for Life uh, Tobacco-Free Recovery Program at www.breatheeasync.org. Thanks so much for that, Sally. And I think we'll put that in the chat, um, that link in the chat. I'll say I, I took a look at that myself and found the testimonial from um, your provider partners um, in Mecklenburg County is just so powerful and thoughtful about, you know, the long-term sort of resistance to going there in behavioral health settings and all of the concerns and apprehensions about it and um, being able to talk about the experience and the successes um, uh, uh, that, that they've achieved thus far. So um, encourage folks to check that out. Um, Cindy, I'm going to turn to you um, and uh, for, for some last words here. Um, we just heard a little bit about what's going in North Carolina would love to hear how California Quits has partnered with Medi-Cal and health plans across the state um, to improve um, access to cessation, cessation services. Great, thank you. California Quits works with three key sectors, county health departments, safety net health systems, and Medi-Cal managed care plans with the goal of creating some collective impact around tobacco treatment integration and safety net health systems. To date, we've worked with over 40 safety net health systems 32 out of 58 counties, and 18 out of 26 Medi-Cal managed care plans. Currently, we have four health plans who are actively working on population health proactive um, cessation outreach strategies. This is an important systematic effort to link Medi-Cal managed care plans with our state quit line and create a formalized partnership that allows the quit line to then service uh, Medi-Cal members in, in a systematic way. Versus, you know, what I shared earlier, going to the doctor and then having that referral submitted um, electronically. So this is very exciting, more to come here. And I have to put a plug in for tobacco quality metrics. So historically, you know, we have to think about why we're measuring these metrics in the way we are. We're excited that we've worked with uh, our Department of Healthcare Services Quality Incentive Pool Program. This year will be the first year where they're uh, breaking out Smokers Council that's going to give us a closer look on what is really happening in terms of patients who are identified as tobacco users and what happens. Are they getting the support that they need? So this is very exciting. Uh, it starts this year. Uh, I just want to put a plug in for there's an opportunity to change the tobacco assessment and, and treatment quality metrics nationally and across the state level as that trickles down to our health systems and health plans. Thank you so much for that, Cindy. It's such a powerful tool um, on the, the healthcare policy and healthcare system side. And ideally those data are broken out and stratified by race and ethnicity to really get to the disparities and the health equity issues that we've been talking about today. Um, Keith, any parting guidance um, uh, or advice um, to, our, to our audience today based on this discussion? Yeah, uh, well, I should say very clearly that, that this has been a wonderful conversation. Um, you know, as a historian, I am more comfortable looking back and learning from the past. And if I were to write another chapter, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic about what the next chapter, the post menthol chapter, will look like based on this conversation. Uh, I, I would say a couple of things. One is that what I've learned is that it's important to seize the moment here, um, that, that, put, that this moment puts cessation and the implementation of cessation 
onto the radar of, of health policymakers, but what that actually will look like is a story that, that's yet to be written. Um, it involves communities, it involves resources, it involves uh, state government, it involves Medicaid programs and multiple others. The second is, um, you know, making sure that, you know, insofar as the menthol ban is important, it also, it, it, it interrupts initiation. So we might focus on cessation, but the key here is also interrupting initiation of smoking. And it's important to make sure that that sticks. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why I think that's important is already you've seen the industry it, facing menthol bans in other countries do something that is kind of shrewd and maybe legally defensible, but maybe not. And that is, you know, the FDA law is about using menthol as a characterizing flavor. And abroad, what you've seen the industry doing is making cigarettes with menthol at slightly lower levels and making the argument that this, this is, these are not menthols as with characterizing flavors. After all, tobacco has tons of flavors in them. People wouldn't smoke really if, menthol, if they didn't have a wide range of, of flavors in them. So the, the question of what is a characterizing flavor and what is therefore legally prohibited, I would expect to be another line of legal argumentation. So making sure this sticks is not just a question of you know, enforcing the, the, the language of the law, but actually defining the language of the menthol ban more clearly. And then I guess the last thing I would say is, you know, making menthol into, it's, it's stri striking to me that in state after state, um, Oklahoma, Kentucky, we have state attorneys general that are holding the makers of OxyContin um, liable and accountable for the devastating effects of the opioid crisis. Um, and in some ways, we did this with the tobacco industry, but some people argue the 1998 settlement was really not enough. And so there's, uh, you know, I think one of the things that Damati pointed out is the importance of the, taking, uh, making, take, making the legal avenues available um, to, to make sure, taking advantage of the legal avenues available to make sure that um, those who are interested in smoking, non-initiation and cessation, continue to use the legal processes to make sure um, that we advance the health of the public more broadly. So anyway, those are my optimistic, cautious, optimistic ideas about what the next chapter in the history of menthol and smoking might mean. Thank you, Keith. Um, thank you all so much um, to this wonderful panel for joining us um, today and engaging in such a rich discussion. Thank you to our audience for hanging in there. I know we're a few minutes over um, so I appreciate you hanging in there. Um, please, as noted in the chat, we would um, so deeply appreciate if folks could complete uh, the online evaluation that will pop up on your screen. We would love to get your feedback um, on how to make um, uh, events like this most useful to you. Um, so with that, I wish you all a wonderful day. Thanks again to the panel. Thanks for all your, your leadership in this area and here's to a hopefully brighter ish, uh, future ahead um, as it relates to the issues we talked about today. Thank you so much, everyone.